you can open your Bibles up to Acts chapter 4 uh, is where we're going to be uh, this morning. If you've been with us lately, we've been doing a series through the book of Acts uh, that, that we will continue today. Today we'll pick up where we left off in chapter 4 and it will bring us over into chapter 5 uh, today. We've seen a lot of, of pictures of the early church in Acts here in the beginning part of Acts and we really continue to see that uh, in Acts chapter 4 Today, well, one of the biggest themes that, that, that we've seen permeate through uh, the, the early church that we continue to see in the beginning part of the story really is unity. The, the unity that they experienced behind having a, a common goal, a, a common goal which was the gospel we'll get to, but, but this common goal that unified them and brought them together uh, after what they were pursuing, that their strength in having a common bond with people. If, you, if you've met someone and, and you have a lot in common, that there, there's strength there, that there's strength in a common uh, bond. Or a lot of people get on board uh, but behind the same things at once, right? Maybe some of you have watched the Olympics this week, right? The idea of, of rooting for our country together. I have not watched a swim meet in about four years. Uh, and after this week, I probably won't watch another one for about four more years. But this week, I've watched some, right? Like We, we, we like cheering for something Together and in a greater story, we see that through the story of the gospel in the early church. But what's interesting that we see in this story of unity this morning is what happens when that's endangered. Right? What happens when the when the unity starts to to break up a little bit? How is reconciliation brought there? What what does it look like? Because ultimately, what we talk about in our next steps course, but but the devil does not want the church to be unified. The, the, the devil does not want the church to be unified because he knows if it's unified that, that it's going to be a force for the kingdom. Right. It's going to be a force to do the, the Lord's work. So he is going to do everything he can to, to put that unity to the test, to put that unity to the test. There was a, a, a game show that was on several years ago. I don't know if you've seen it, but essentially the, the, how the game show would work is these two people would work together uh, to, to build this pot of money, uh, right? And at the end of the game show, they would then have to decide if they were going to split it or if they were going to steal it from the other person. Has anybody ever seen this show? Do y'all know what I'm talking about? None of you. Okay, great. I got one. Uh-huh. Thank you, Miss Rhodes. I appreciate it. All right. No one else has seen this show. So me and Miss Ro- Isaac has. Okay, cool. So uh, I'll, I'll explain it to you a little bit more. But basically, they would work together, answer these questions to build up this money, all right? And then at the end of it, they each had um, two, two choices, basically. And so that they would hold these choices, and their options were to steal it uh, or, or to split it, right? So if they, if they both choose to split it, then they each go home 50-50. So th- say the pot was 40 grand was the last one that I watched when preparing for this. If they, if they each split it, they each walk away with 20 grand. Make sense, right? If they, if they both say that they're going to steal it, then they both walk away with nothing. E- each one of them gets nothing. If one of them says they're going to steal it and one of them says they're going to split it, then the one who says they're going to steal it walks away with 40 grand. The one who said split it walks away with nothing. You tracking with me? And so, so before they have to make this decision, they have this, this basically open discussion between each other of why they're trying to convince each other that they're going to split it, right? They're, they're going to split it with that other person and they'll try and sell them. We've worked together this whole time. We've done all these things, but we're just going to split it. Uh, and, and then obviously it plays out different ways in different episodes. The one I watched, my man stole 40 grand from her. So he, he stole it from her. But the, the, the idea is there is unity at the beginning, but, but then when it comes down to it, is the unity going to remain or is the unity going to be broken? And that's the question that, that we have to ask ourselves. That's the question that the early church was faced with here in this story. So this morning, we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at how unity was established, but we're going to look at how unity was experienced, and then we're going to look at how unity was endangered. How unity was established, this is on your notes. You can write this down. Uh, we, we talked about it earlier, but unpack it a little bit more. Unity was established through the gospel. The, the unity that these people were experiencing was, was first established through the gospel. Acts chapter 4, uh, verse 32 to 33, it says, Now, the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace what was upon them all. And so, so it says that they were, they were witness to the, the resurrection and they became one heart and one soul because of it, because what they had witnessed together, that they were on the same page and Jesus wanted his people to be unified. And the reality is what we see in our lives is the more that we are desiring, the more that we are striving to be more like 
Christ, the more we will value one another and remain committed to the mission of Christ. But, but the thing with unity is we don't create unity. Right? We, we see it already established here. God had already established unity. The, the unity is already established it's through the gospel. He says what we're called to is we're called to maintain the unity. But we're called to maintain unity. God has already created unity. So, so as a body of believers, as a body of Christ, we see pictured in the scriptures, he says that the unity is already there, but, but we're called to maintain it. If you, if you rewind earlier in chapter 4, you, you don't have to go there, but in verse 4 it talks about that, that, that 5,000 men were, were added that day, right? Surely many of them uh, were probably married. There were probably some kids involved. How, how, is it, how is it possible for that many people to, to be unified? How is it possible for that many people to come together under the same thing? It, it was because they believed the gospel. It, it was through the gospel. The gospel was what brought unity, but, but what did it do to their lives? That brings us to the next part. Write this down. How unity was experienced. Unity was experienced for them through generosity. Unity was experienced through generosity. Verse 34 through 35, it says, uh, nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all were possessors of land or houses, or I'm sorry, for all who were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. So, so this is where for them, this unity that was already established, right? The unity was already established through the gospel. This is where they started to experience the unity. It, it became experienced unity in their own lives. These people were the most generous people on earth. Everything what was in common for them, their, their property, their, their possessions, what, what, whatever it took that they were sharing, all of it. But, but here's the main idea. Here's what these people that, that we see in this early church had done. They had, they had loosened their grip on their stuff and they had tightened their grip on each other, right? They, they, they had loosened their grip on, on their stuff, on, on the worldly possessions, on the thing that everybody else would say is important, and they had tightened their grip on each other. And so, so the, the point of the message today, right, we're, we're not supposed to dismiss, uh, and then every single one of you list your house today, right? That, that's, not, that's not what we're talking about, right? Go sell it all, right? That's not what we're saying. But, but there is something that can be learned from the, from the radical generosity of the early church here, and how it, how it drew them together, how it was experiential unity that they experienced together because of what that they were doing. I heard this illustration talking about this specific passage. I thought it was really cool. Uh, when it came to generosity, I wanted to read it to you. It says this. It says, when it comes to generosity, some are like a rock. For God to get anything out of them, he has to hammer, and even then he only gets chips and sparks. Some are like a sponge, you can get something out of them, but in order for God to do it, he has to squeeze. Some, however, are like a honeycomb. Generosity is just constantly dripping off of them, which, which ultimately is what, is what the gospel is all about. It's what the gospel is meant to, to do, to take hearts of stone and to turn them into something that is, that is just dripping with generosity, that, that is just dripping with, with a love for, for people. But again, rhetorical question, you don't have to answer this one out loud, but, but where would you put yourself? Like on that scale, where do you put yourself? Let's keep reading. Verse 36 and 37, it says, And Joseph, who was named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, which if you needed a cool name, that's a great name, uh, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. All right, so, so, so we have this example, right? He, he, he talks about, uh, that he talks about what, what's going on here in the early church, right? He said that they were selling possessions, they were selling land, and they were bringing it forward. And then right after he says that, he, he gives us an example of someone who's doing it. Right? He introduces us to someone, he says, that, then there, there's Barnabas, and he's translated son of encouragement, which is important. And he says he had some land, he sold it, and he brought it and laid it at the apostles' feet, which if you read this, you could say, okay, you just told us they were doing that, and now you're just telling us an example of someone who's doing it, but, but it, it makes sense as you continue to, to read. But Barnabas is a really cool guy. Barnabas is, uh, makes six different appearances uh, in Acts, and what he's doing here is he's really leading the way with giving, 
He's really leading the way with giving. He does a lot of cool things throughout the book of Acts. He's one of the, uh, he is rather the first person to, to welcome Paul uh, back in chapter 9 after his conversion uh, of becoming saved. He welcomes Paul back with open arms. So many other things as we continue uh, in Acts that we'll see from him. But, but ultimately, the summary of what he is doing is what we said earlier. You can write this on your sheets. Barnabas' hold on his stuff was loose, but, but his hold on others was tight. His hold on his stuff was loose, but, but his hold on others what was tight. He, he had some things, and he was, he was freely willing to give them for, for the betterment of, of the people of Christ, for, for the betterment of the body of Christ. His hold on his stuff was loose, but, but his hold on others what was tight. So, so then that begs the question, what, what, is, what is our hold on in our life? Right, what, is, what is the thing that, that we are holding on to, that, that we are gripping uh, on to? I, I know for, for many of us, you probably have uh, specific memories from when you were younger uh, as a kid, specific things that you can remember. One of the things I can remember is whenever we would go to uh, my, my grandparents' house and all the cousins would be there, he would always had this giant jar uh, of change, which they would always just like drop their pocket change in, I guess, every day. Uh, and so they had this big jar of change, but it had a narrow opening at the top. And when all the grandkids were there, he would let us each stick our hand in the jar and grab as much change out of the jar that we could get, and we could take it home with us. And it was like the greatest thing we ever got to do, right? We were like filthy rich. And so, uh, and so we, we'd stick our hand in this jar, but inevitably what would happen is we, we'd grab onto all these coins and try and pull our hand out of the jar, but, but it wouldn't fit on the way out, right? And so in, in wrestling it, not wanting to let go of what we have, inevitably we would end up dropping most of the change that we had in the first place, and we were only allowed to try once. There were no second tries, right? And so, 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 so we would do this and we would pull it out, whereas if we would just go in with a little bit more of an open hand and just pull out what we could get, we probably would have ended up with more, but, but we couldn't process that. And I think in our own lives that the, the same thing is so true, we, we, we are holding on so tightly to, to whatever we, it is that, that we've convinced ourselves is important, whether it's, it's people's perception of us, whether it's what worldly success, whatever it is, we're gripping so tightly onto these things that, that our hands aren't open enough to grip onto what the Lord tells us to hold on to. He, he says what, what's important here is unity. But we have to ask ourselves, well, what are the things that, that are important to us. And so I, I want us to take time to pause and, and to see the, the generosity of Barnabas here because it goes in complete contrast with, with the next story that, that we're going to see in, in chapter 5. These two passages are, are interesting because what Luke does here is he presents both one picture that is beautifully positive, right, and, and encouraging, and then this next picture that we'll see that is terrifying and sobering, honestly. And, and he paints these two Together, so, so we're going to read the next story together, Acts chapter 5. We're going to read the whole story together, and then we'll unpack it a little bit. Verses 1 through 11, it says this. It says, But a certain man uh, named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias... Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? So, so pause for a second. Who's behind this? Right? Peter said, he says that, that it's, it's Satan. Right? This, is the, this is the first post-cross appearance of Satan here. And so before the cross, Satan's strategy was to kill Jesus. When that didn't work because Jesus conquered death, he's now on mission to destroy the church from within. He, he does not want to see the church grow, and so, so he's going to work through these people to try and destroy the church from within. Keep going. Verse 4. It says, while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but, but to God. So, 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 so what was wrong here with what they did, right? It, it wasn't that they kept part of the money. Peter addresses that. The problem was... The Ananias and Sapphira presented it as a gift that it was the full amount, but, but it wasn't. That they presented it as something that, that it wasn't. Verse 5, it says, Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it's about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for, for so much. Which again, pause. Can you imagine being in that crowd? Like they obviously know what's happening and they're just like, 
ooh, like, like what is going to happen here? She says, yes, for, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last, and the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who had heard these things. Right, so, so obviously a lot here. This is, this is an intense passage. We, we just finished hearing about Barnabas, about his generosity, but, but then the author takes this part and he introduces it. He says, but there was a certain man. It says, it says, this had all happened, these great things had happened. It said, but that there was a certain man. And so there's some commonalities we see in this story. Both stories use uh, the, the adjective great to describe them. The first one, we see great grace. Uh, the, the second one, we see great fear in the last verse. And as a whole, the, the both stories point to the importance of, of unity. But the first one, obviously, depicting how unity was experienced, and then the second one showing, which is on your sheet as well, how unity was endangered, which was through hypocrisy. How unity was endangered, which was through hypocrisy. What I appreciate about Luke here as he's writing this is that he doesn't, he, he doesn't brush under the rug the, the faults of the early church. Right? We've seen a lot of really great things that, that, that were going on, a lot of incredible things that, that were happening with the early church, but, but he's being real here about what is going on, this sad story that, that follows this beautiful one, right? which we said it earlier. We say it in our 101 class as well, that, that when you become a follower of Christ, man, it puts a target on your back. The, the devil does not want to see you succeed. He, he does not want to see you do well. He does not want to see your family do well. He does not want to see, by any means, your, your church do well, that, that there's a target on us, and, and we have to be aware of that. But we, we have to, to know that, right? We have to know that he doesn't want us to succeed. And so, so, so we see him try and use these people, use Ananias and Sapphira to, to disrupt the unity within the church. And there were a couple different attributes um, that he was able to do that through their lives. I want to unpack some of them on your sheets. You can write these down. The first one is this, is they were praise seekers, that they were praise seekers. Ananias and Sapphira were, were, were looking for the, the praise. They were looking for the recognition. Let's go back and read verse 1 and 2. It says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So, so, so what they chose, what we see in a later verse, that they worked together to, to conceive is that they wanted the reputation of Barnabas without actually having the generosity of Barnabas, right? They, they, they wanted the recognition of, of looking exactly like what Barnabas had just done, but, but they didn't want to actually do what Barnabas had just done. And if we're not careful, but we can do the same things in, in our own lives, right? We, we live our lives for, for the applause of the people around us. As long as it looks like everything is going great, then, then we're good to go and we live for this applause. And it's, man, look, look how much they're going to church. Look, look how much they are, they are serving. They're doing so well. Look how hardworking that person is. Look, look how well they're leading their family, man, all these things, but, which those things are great, great things, should do all of those things. But, but the question we have to ask ourselves is, is why are we doing them? Right? Because if the only reason that we're doing them is for the applause of the people around us, then we're, we're completely missing the point. But we're completely missing the point. He, he says he, he's called us to these things, but we're called to, to know and to make known the glory of the Lord, not the glory of ourselves, but, but the world will tell us, man, just, just make yourself look as good as you can. Just paint the best picture that, that you can. It can be completely broken on the inside, but as long as it looks good on the outside, you're good to go. They were seeking the approval of men. They were praise seekers. Number two, they were liars. Put, put blunt, bluntly, that they, they, were, they were liars. Verse three, it says, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for, for yourself? They lied about what they had given. And it says that they did it together. In Romans chapter three, Paul calls one of the symptoms of the sin nature lying. It is a symptom of our sin nature, right? We'll take, a, we'll take an unscientific poll in here. How many of this room have ever told a lie before? Anyone in this room ever told a lie? All right. 
I see some people not raising their hand. You're lying right now, all right? So you, you've not, you have told a lie. Today was your first one, or really your second one. But we have told a lie, right? And the reality of lying is lying isn't something we, we, you have to teach, right? Like for those of you with kids, you never had to sit them down and be like, now this is how it's going to work. You're going to do this, but you're going to say you did this, right? Like they, no, one, no one does that, right? We have, a, we have two boys. Uh, and when one of them, I won't tell you which one, what was three, um, we, he, was, uh, he was eating his breakfast. Uh, and so uh, we had made him whatever it was for breakfast. I just remember there was sausage there. There was a sausage link. It's important. It comes back. But uh, <laughs> there was sausage on the plate. And so I, I'm get upstairs getting ready. And so uh, my son, he says, he said, Papa, Papa, I hear him yelling. So I come downstairs. He says, I really want some Teddy Grahams. I'm like, dude, it's 730 in the morning. You do not need Teddy Grahams. We're not eating Teddy Grahams for breakfast today. He's like, I really, really want some Teddy Grahams. I'm like, I'm like, all right, well, here's what we'll do. You finish all your breakfast. You finish eating your sausage. And then you can have, I'll get you some Teddy Grahams before we leave for the day. He's like, okay, so Sounds good. So I go back upstairs. I finish getting ready. About five minutes goes by. I hear him call for me again. I come downstairs. He says, I, f- I finished my breakfast. And I look at his plate. His plate's empty. And I'm like, all right, bud, you can have a couple Teddy Grahams. So I grab him out of the pantry and I pour him on his plate. And he hops up on his stool and he's, he's eating these Teddy Grahams. Uh, and I, I go to put them back in the pantry. And then I go to round the corner to go back to, to finish getting ready. And right after I do, do that, he had eaten about three or four Teddy Grahams. And he hops off his stool. And we have this, uh, we have this uh, cabinet in our, in our room that holds all of like our board games. And he, he opens his up, pulls out his sausage link, and goes back and sits back at his chair, takes a bite of sausage, puts it on his plate. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm looking at him like, I said, did you take your sausage? And I was like, who said, this is sentences you don't plan on saying as an adult. Did you take your sausage and hide it in the game closet so that you could have Teddy Grahams? To which he immediately, like, realizing what has happened and what is coming as a result of it, he's like, he's like, sh- like shuddering, de- shutting down in fear. He's like, he's like, I, I, I did, I did, right? And so, obviously, we, 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 we had a discussion from there. But he, 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 I didn't teach him how to do that, right? Like, I, I never sat him down. I'm like, you're going to take the sausage link. You're going to shove it in the game closet, right? So you can get some Teddy Grahams, right? Like, the, no, the, that conversation never happened, right? But we, we, we just know how to do it. God, God calls his children to, to be people of integrity. Right? There's so many things that we have to remember. First and foremost, as a believer in Christ, that, that we are his children, right? He loves us. His love is never changing, but, but he's called us to things because he knows what's best for us. And he's called us to be children of integrity, to speak the, the truth. But Ananias and Sapphira lied. Number three, they were greedy. They were greedy. Again, verse 3 says, why, why, why has Satan filled your heart to, to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Verse 3, it says they, they kept back part of it. And the verb used here means to, to pilfer, pilfer, can't say that word, or, or to embezzle. They, they were doing it secretly. It's the, it's the same verb that occurs uh, in Joshua in the Greek when it's talking about the story of Achan. It was the one who, after the battle of Jericho, when they were told to not take anything from them, he, he took some of the gold, he took some of the things and hid them uh, amongst his family, and his family was ultimately destroyed for it. But, but it's the same word here, both stories showing the devastating nature of greed, the, the devastating nature of greed and, and what it does to us. And he says it must have no place in the church. It, it, it doesn't belong there. So, so they were greedy. Number four, they were deceivers. That they were deceivers. Acts chapter 5, verse 4 says, While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived these things in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. He says they, they, they planned what they did. But, but God always knows what's done and what's said in secret. And nothing him is, is catching him by surprise. Nothing is, is hidden from him. And so we have this unique passage, these two stories that that show the the difference between what we obviously are called to do and what we obviously shouldn't do. But but, but what are we supposed to do with that, right? We we see these things, but but, but what do we we take from this? What what do we learn from this? What do we apply from this? Four lessons I want us to see this morning as we wrap it up. Number one is to be a doer and not an imitator. Be a doer and not an imitator. On On the outside... Ananias and Sapphira looked equally as great as Barnabas. To to everyone else who was there, uh, until God's judgment was received, Ananias and Sapphira would have been in the exact same boat uh, as as Barnabas. They they looked like they were doing the right things. They were active in the church. They were were generous. But but deep in their heart, there was a love of people's praise 
and a love of people's or of their own money that they had never confessed. John Newton says it this way. He says, we are great imitators, mimicking the motions, words, but often from a heart that has not been converted because we've never repented of our idolatry of praise and money. We, we haven't repented of our own uh, idolatry. Grant talked about it a few weeks ago, that there can be a reality where we're close enough to Christianity that we receive some of the benefits of it but without actually experiencing the relationship of it. So, so the question isn't, is, is your proximity close enough that, that you're experiencing some of the things that someone in a, who is a believer would experience, but, but is there a relationship of your own with Jesus Christ, right? Do, do you have a relationship with the Savior, James 1.22, tells us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. But that last part is so big, deceiving yourselves. He says, you're not, you're not deceiving God, right? You're, you're not pulling one over on him and, and you, you, you've got this one in the bag. No, he says, you're, you're only deceiving yourself, which brings us to number two. We cannot hide from God, right? We, we, we cannot hide from the Lord, we, we, we can't hide from him as much as we want to, but we, we can't do it. And it's, like a, it's like when your phone goes off somewhere in public and it's supposed to be quiet, but your phone's obviously not quiet. And it's like the, fr- the frantic grab for your phone to try and make it stop going off. You tracking with me? I, when, I was a, when, I was a freshman, uh, when I was a freshman at NC State, some of the freshman classes that you take are really big classes. So I had this one class in particular. It was an accounting class and had 350 people in this class, which is like, absurd. And it's in this like movie theater. And so uh, I sat on the back row of this class, like literally the very back row uh, with a friend of mine who went, to, who went to church here as well, actually. And so we would sit on the back row of this class. And I remember one day we were in this class and uh, we were working on some stuff on our computer. And all of a sudden I go down to get my phone and I realize I don't have my phone on me anymore. And I'm like, oh man, I like I know I had it that morning when I was in the coffee shop in the building, but, but I don't have it anymore. And so I'm like, well, where's Where's my phone? And so I, you know, on the, on the computer, I log on. I, they have like the find your iPhone thing. And I look at it and it says, my phone is now in the building that's next door, which is the biology building, which I had no biology classes. So I'm like, someone has taken my phone and, and gone to another building. Like they're in a completely different building. And so it gave me like options of what I could do. I could shut the phone down, right? Or I could make it like make this dinging noise until I come and unlock it. Basically, I'm like, I'm gonna stick it to this person. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it like start dinging in the middle of their class till they get rid of this phone. And so I, I press this button, and about like three or four seconds after I press this button, all of a sudden I hear this, I hear this ding, 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 and I'm like, oh my God, did you hear that? I look over to my friend, she's like, yeah, I heard it. ding, 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 and it, and it just keeps going like every five seconds to when, until finally the, the professor who's in the middle of the lecture stops his lecture, and he goes, do you guys hear that? And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, we hear it, and he's like, and it like hits him, and he says, oh, he said, uh, he, he said, at the beginning of class, someone gave me this phone, it, it's on his podium, like right by the microphone, he says, someone gave me this phone that they found outside in the hallway, is this one of you guys? To which I then, uh, to raise my hand and, and, and go down to the front of 350 people and, and grab my phone, which is, if that's not embarrassing enough, they all start clapping, right? So they're all like <laughs> applauding now, he's been reunited w- with his phone, right? It's like, there, there, was no, there was no hiding that one, that that was my phone uh, that, that went off that, that, that went off super loud, right? But, but uh, uh, we, I say it jokingly, but, but I think if we're being honest with ourselves, that is how we can picture our thoughts when it comes to the Holy Spirit, like, as much as we, we would want them to be silent, right, like, he knows them, right, but yet we're almost like, if I, if I, can, if I can just shift gears really quick, maybe, maybe he didn't catch that one, right, maybe he didn't, he didn't catch what, what, whatever it is, right, but we have this idea that, that, that we, can make it, we can make it without him knowing, but, but he knows everything, he knows everything. He knows the great things that are going on in your life that you haven't told anyone. He knows the terrible things in your life that are going on that you haven't told anyone. He knows it all. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Ananias and Sapphira were, Sapphira were banking on people looking at the outward appearance. But, but they forgot that the Lord looks at the heart. The, the Lord looks at the, the heart. Ananias knew this, but, but they, had, they had forgotten it. That They were so consumed with, with the praise of, of people that they forgot the only opinion that actually matters, which is that of Christ. It's the Lord's opinion. So we cannot hide from God. Number three is that fear is a part of worship. Fear is a part of worship. Might be an odd thing to hear, but fear really does lace itself 
through this passage, but I want to be clear about what we're talking about. Definition for biblical fear uh, that, that we'll use today on your sheets is this, is awe mixed with intimacy. Awe mixed with intimacy. It is an intimate relationship with the Lord while still being in awe of who he is and what he has done. When we come together as a church family, what we're doing is we're coming together in the presence of a holy God, in the presence of a holy God. And so as the fear of God increases, so does the sense of his love. So does the sense of who he is. It's in a hymn uh, that, that, that we would sing, "'Tis grace that taught my heart to fear." It teaches our, our heart to fear who he is. Fear is a part of worship, right? Fear is a part of worship. Fast forward uh, to, to chapter nine again. Grant's gonna kill me for going to chapter nine so much when we get to chapter nine, but it, it'll be fine. Chapter nine, verse 31. It says, then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. Don't miss this. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. And so, so this is now after the, this interaction of what had happened with Ananias and Sapphira. And it says that, that the church was growing, the Lord was moving, and it was through the fear of the Lord and the comfort of his Holy Spirit that, that, were multi, that the church was multiplied. Right, man, don't, don't miss this, right? Like, I, I don't want to just read this story and brush over it as if it's another Bible story. The, the, the event of the death of Ananias and Sapphira was intense. Right? Like, that, that was intense. Like, imagine going to the church gathering and they're like dragging them out, right? Like, it's like they're, they're dragging, like, that's, that's crazy, right? Like, imagine being a visitor that day. Like, that's, a, that's wild, right? It's like, what, what is happening? Like, what, what have I gotten myself into sort of thing? It's, it's intense. How, how does the church move on from something like that? Right? Like, again, I think we just think, oh, it was in the Bible, so that's, that's how things went. Another, another Sunday, right? Like, that, that wasn't another Sunday. Like, how, how did they move on from that? He says it was through the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It is through him, which brings us to number four. And the, the ultimate crust of what we see in this story is that sin is serious to God. Sin is serious to God. It is serious to him, but I think in our minds we can convince ourselves that it's not that big of a deal. I think similarly with how it goes when you have more than one kid, right? That first kid, anytime you go somewhere, you are well equipped, right? Like you have the diapers, you have the wipes, you have a change of outfits, you have toys, even though they don't play with toys yet. Like you have everything, right? But then like the second kid comes or we're expecting our third kid, like you start bringing less things with you because you know they'll be all right sort of thing, right? Like I still would argue that we're pretty prepared when it comes to our kids for stuff. My kids love some snacks, so we always got snacks. But, uh, but there are days where it's like we just got to get out the door and it's like if we got some diapers and an EpiPen because our kids have some food allergies, like we can get out of here, right? Like we, we got to roll sort of thing. Like I, I think in, in our own lives, the, the, the longer, uh, in, in a dark twist, obviously, the, the longer sin stays a part of our life, the, the less we become affected by it. The, the, the longer or the more prevalent a, a sin that is in our life, the, the less it even bothers us. It, it's, just, it's, just, it's just part of, of the norm. Right? I'm, do, I'm doing great in, in all these areas, but, but there is this one area that, that I know I just keep messing up, but, you know... It, it, it is what it is. It's been there. I don't really th think it's going anywhere. And we can kind of dumb down the effects of the severity of it, but, but it's a big deal. And, and maybe we just use it to describe ourselves. I just, I'm just a hothead, right? Like I, I'm just short-tempered. It's just the cross I bear, right? Like uh, that's just how it's going to be. Or I, I'm only dishonest sometimes, right? I, I'm a pretty honest person. I'm only dishonest sometimes at, at work. It's really not th that big of a deal. Or I, I only watch this stuff that I'm not supposed to every now and then, right? Or, or, or we start justifying it, right? I am this way because of fill-in life experience that happened to me, right? Which, which not dumbing that, that down by any means, or, or at least I'm nowhere near as far as so-and-so is, right? I'm, not, I'm nowhere near that bad, but, but, but none of it matters because all that scripture says is that all sin is serious to God. It's all serious to him. All sin, all sin is included in the sin that required the ultimate sacrifice from Jesus Christ on the cross. Every sin that we partake in, it is a part of why Jesus had to take our punishment on a cross. But, but if we're being honest, that there may, may be a part of us that, that reads a passage like this and is like, isn't, isn't that like a bit much? Like, isn't, isn't that a little, a little intense? I was reading a commentary about this story 
and I wrote this down, I thought it was really good. He said, if we are offended by the swift judgment of God described here, it reveals our ignorance of God's holiness, our sinfulness, and the seriousness of our sin in relation to his holiness. It, it, it is a diminished view of God's holiness and our sinfulness and the relation to which our sinfulness is, is to his holiness. So, so the question should not be, why did they die? The question then in turn should be, well, why am I still here? Like, well, why am I still here? If they told one lie and we're, and we're literally drug out, then why am I still here? If, if we truly believe Jesus did what he did, that, that he took our shame and that he was beaten and mocked and scorned for, for our sins, then how can we neglect or, or, or not take serious the very sin that put him on the cross in the first place? How can we not take that serious in our own lives? So, so here's what I want to leave you with this morning. The question I want to leave you with to ask yourself is, are you a Barnabas or are you an Ananias and Sapphira? Are, are you a Barnabas or are you an Ananias or, or Sapphira? Are, are you spilling out what, with the love of Christ in your life or, or are you just playing the part? Does it just, does it just look good? It, it looks great, but, but there's no relationship. I think in this room, we would all say the same thing here, right? We're, we're all at church, right? But, but do, do we live it? Do, do we live it? Do we live it out in our life? There's a quote by Jim Elliott, uh, and he was talking about the, the song, I Surrender All, which we've sung here so, so many times. I, all to, I'm not going to sing it for you. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. Right? Oh, I surre- it's, it's surrendering everything to Jesus, everything that, that, that we have. And in referring to that song, this is what Jim Elliott said. He said, too often Christians don't tell lies, they just sing them. He, he said, too often in our lives Christians don't tell lies, they just sing them. That they come to church and they sing the song on a Sunday, on a, on a Wednesday, well, whatever it is. They, they they sing these things, but but they're not a part of their life. It is your life fully surrendered to Christ? It is your life fully surrendered to Him? Right? Or, or is there there a piece that, that that maybe you're trying to hold back for, for yourself? If, if you're a believer in this room this morning, you, you know there's been a time where you've put your faith and trust in Christ. I, I, I want you to analyze your own heart this morning. Is, is there something that, that you're still trying to hold on to that, that you're not surrendering to the Lord? Because his word says that he wants all of it. He, he wants your whole heart. He, he wants your whole life. Have you truly surrendered it all to him? Have you truly given it all to him? Maybe you're in this room and you've never put your faith and trust in Christ. His word says he wants this, you to surrender your life to him. And it's the greatest thing that, that you can ever do. Because don't miss the end of the story. God's spirit kept moving, but the gospel kept multiplying, and people kept getting saved. The, the Lord was still doing a, a work. Our sin is bad. Our sin is wretched. But God's grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. He is made perfect in our weakness, he says, if we, if we will call out to him, if we will confess that to him. So as we close out this morning, I want everyone to, to bow your heads and close your eyes a, a little bit different as we close out this morning. If, you were, if you're in this room and, and you are a believer, you know there has been a time in your life you have put your faith and trust in Christ. Man, but, but before we even jump into the rest of the invitation, I, I just want you to be doing business with the Lord this morning and saying, God, I, I know that I've trusted in you for salvation. I know I've given my life to you. But, but if I'm being honest, I don't know if, there, if I've truly surrendered every area of my life. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's family relationship issues. Maybe it's a sin struggle that, that you're dealing with. Man, I just want you to do business with the Lord and give it to him today. Give it to him this morning. But man, if, if, if you're in this room and you've never experienced your own relationship with Christ, his word says he invites you into that. The, the, from the outside in, everything might look great. You might have been here for, for years, but, but you've never truly experienced your own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. His word says he came to seek and to save that which is lost. He, he says in the middle of our brokenness, in the middle of our sin, that he sent his son to die on a cross for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And if we confess our sins, his word says he is faithful and he is just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, man, if in this room you've never done that, you've never truly given your life to Christ, I want to invite you to do that this morning. 
It is not in the magic words of a prayer. It is in your heart's desire to know him and to have a relationship with him. And so if that's you, I want to invite you to pray with me this morning in the quietness of your own heart to call out to the Lord and say, say this, say, God, I want to know you and I want to have a relationship with you. God, I want to know you and I want to have a relationship with you. God isn't mad at you. He, he loves you. I want to know you. I want to have a relationship with you. God, I, I know that I'm a sinner, but I believe you sent your son to die. And I believe that he rose again. So will you forgive me today, Jesus? God, I give you my life. I surrender it all to you. If you're in this room today, everybody's heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed. If you made that decision to follow Christ today, I want you to do two things when you leave here. I want you to tell someone that you trust about the decision that you made. Tell someone. Find one of our staff. Find a close friend that you know loves the Lord. Tell them about the decision that you made. And on your way out today, we have a next steps bag, a fresh start bag rather, in the back of the sanctuary there. In the back on the bottom floor, in the back on the balcony, has a Bible in there, has some information on the decision that you made to follow Christ. I want you to take one of those on your way out this morning and read through it. Christian in this room, May we truly surrender everything that we have in our lives to Jesus. God, we come before you and we thank you for your faithfulness. God, we thank you for your goodness, even though we are broken. God, I pray for myself. I pray for everyone in this room, God, that our hearts would be fully surrendered to you. God, that we won't try and just look like we have it figured out from the outside, but that we will truly have hearts that are full of the love of Christ, that are full of what you've called us to as a believer. God, we love you, we praise you, we pray you'll have your hands over this place. God, we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen.